Let us dwell together in peace. And let us not be instruments of our own or of others' oppression. And now may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. The wages of sin is death. I want to say that it's the wages of sin are death, or the wage of sin is death. The agreement bothers me a lot there. But in any case, the wages, we read, of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, that sounds like religious gobbledygook, doesn't it? Maybe not if you grew up Baptist. Maybe not if you grew up Pentecostal. Maybe not if you grew up in church, period. But if you were one of those people that got dragged to church maybe six times a year, your family wasn't that religious, they said grace at Thanksgiving, this doesn't sound like the way people talk, right? And so what does any of that mean? Well, it may sound like religious gobbledygook, and maybe it is, but it isn't as woogie as it may seem as first. at first. In fact, I think we make a lot of things weirder and stranger and more mysterious than they need to be. First, the wages of sin. Let's just talk about it. Sin is deadly. Sin is harmful. But we need to have a clear picture of what sin is. Sin is not doing a no-no from the naughty list. Do you know what I mean? Like, here are the things. Don't, don't touch yourself there. Don't want to touch them there. Don't, it's not a list of don't. It's, you know, don't drink and don't chew and don't go with folk who do. And all of that silliness. No, that's not what sins are. Sin isn't, isn't a, a legalistic to do and to don't list. Mostly to don't. That's not what sin is. Sin is a state of brokenness. In fact, sin might be the state of brokenness that makes you want to just limit it to a bunch of do's and don'ts so that you can say, well, at least I don't do that. So see how good I am? Or sometimes we really just like beating ourselves up. Oh, I'm such a sinner. I can't stop doing this thing on the, on the no-no list. But sin isn't about boxes to tick. Sin is a condition Sin is an attitude. Sin is a consciousness. Sin is believing the lie. Well, I can just stop right there. Sin is believing a lie. Sin is just believing what isn't true. Sin is believing the lie that we are separate from our source. But how can we be separate from that in which we live and move and have our being? How can we be separate from that which is omnipresent? If there is an omnipresence, if there's an omnipresent love, if there's an omnipresent life, if there's an omnipresent power, if there's an omnipresent energy, if it is omnipresent, it is everywhere fully present and you can't get away from it. You can't be separate from it. Even the psalmist says, if I make my bed in the pit, God is there. There's no getting away from omnipresence. So if I believe that I am separate from that which is everywhere fully present, that is a crazy-making lie. And that that condition, that crazy-making lie that I bought into is sin. Now, when we are in that sinful, that mistaken, that untrue condition, we screw up a lot. But the screw-ups aren't the sin. They are the symptoms of the condition of sin. Believing that gay people are innately evil when there is no evidence to support that bigoted claim. In fact, there are tons of evidence to the contrary. To just decide that gay people are bad, that hateful, hurtful prejudice is sin. That attitude, that lie is sin. Now, the sin... That attitude will cause us to do terrible things. But the terrible things are the symptom of the condition. The condition is sin. The sin of homophobia will cause people to do various unkind, cruel, even diabolical things. The sin is the broken, damaged, false attitude that fueled the regrettable actions. The gay bashings, for example the family rejections, the horrible uh, preaching against people's personhood and their sacred value and their dignity, and the cruel legislation, which is becoming ubiquitous. Robert Schuller defines sin as any attitude or action that robs anyone of dignity or self-esteem. 
If you've ever heard a sermon condemning you, belittling you, demoralizing you, that sermon was a mistake that came out of a condition of sin. Because if someone looks at you and does not see that of God in you, that's their sinful condition. That's not about you. The wages of sin, the cost of living in a broken, damaged, untrue state is deadly. That's not gobbledygook to me. That's the truth. The sin of misogyny hurts women's lives. It doesn't just make them uncomfortable. This has hurt their feelings, though that might should be enough for us to avoid it. But it ruins lives. It diminishes someone's personhood. The sin of transphobia harms transgender people. It literally makes them less safe in the world. It hurts their psyche. It hurts their sense of self. It dehumanizes them. Transphobia is a sin that hurts, that harms transgender people. Now, the ways they are hurt, oh yeah, there are many cruelties, but those are conditions of the sin of transphobia. The sin of nationalism. The sin of nationalism. Whisper to your neighbor, the sin of nationalism. The sin of nationalism keeps us from caring about the pain of others. If we're the greatest, who cares about those other losers? If we are good just by nature of where we landed, well, that doesn't give us much room for compassion for those who are suffering, struggling, and having all kinds of issues. The sin of racism infects the soul of our nation and keeps us from being the lights of love we are meant to be. The cost of sin is just too damned high. But the gift of God. The gift of God is life. We could say that another way. The gift of life is life. We could say it like this. The gift of wholeness is wholeness. The gift of connection is is connection. The gift of love is love. The gift of love is to live abundantly, joyfully, lovingly. The cost of fear and separation is too high, and it's even deadly. But what divine life wants is for us to experience life and love abundantly, forever, as Jesus said, is possible. Now, our second reading today the Reverend Marion read, was from the Sermon on the Mount. That first one was Paul wrote a letter to a house church, tell them about this, this diseased condition called sin, and from that we do all these weird and terrible things. But those things are conditions, not, not the cause. Sin is the condition. Well, here is Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, and he talks about just one thing in particular, but it's in the same vein. It's talking about a, a, an attitude, a condition, a brokenness of soul that causes us to do uh, bad things, bad things to, to one another, to hurt one another. And so that reading from the Sermon on the Mount tells us no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. Well, that sounds like more religious ease. That sounds more like insider language. What is mammon? I happen to know, so I'm going to tell you. Mammon means avarice, the greedy pursuit of gain. It doesn't mean money, because we have to have money. People have money. Uh, it's the barter of the day. It's how we exchange. It's exchange of energy. It's, it's an exchange of, of contract. It's an exchange of intention. So that's the barter of the day. We don't use shells and rocks and cattle and chickens anymore. Uh, so we use, we use money that people make up values for, and we, and we trust that that means what it says, and that's the barter of the day. We need it, and we all work for our paychecks, or we look forward to our monthly pension, which we earned from all those years of, of our uh, weekly and monthly paychecks. Money itself is just the barter of the day, and it can be used for good or not so good purposes. But greed, that's mammon. Greed, that's ugly. And Matthew's Jesus is saying simply, greedy isn't godly. Hoarding isn't godly. The camel squeezed through the eye of a needle easier than do many of the 1%. Now, when my bank account grows, I get excited. When my pension fund grows, I get excited. I think I would anyway. I get excited. 
When, 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 when things work out, when, some, when, a, when a credit card gets paid off, I get excited. When things are prosperous, and I get excited. We all do. That's good. Life is abundant. Uh, nature is extravagant and wasteful and lavish. It's okay that we want to do well. Here's where it gets ugly, where I want to do well, and I don't care if you do well or not. Or I do well, and now I want to do more well, even though I see you're struggling to get by. I have no use for you. I have no time for you. In fact, I'm going to use my influence to get all the perks I can so that everything benefits me even more, even though I know you can't afford medicine or have a, ret- a retirement you can live on. See, it's the greed. Yes, I should want to do well, but I should also want everyone to do well. And if I'm doing a little better than you, then I should at least help you. And if I can't do that, if I can't bring myself to do that, I should at least not work to hurt you. That's what the Dalai Lama says. Help somebody, and if you can't help, at least do no harm. It's a simple ethic, really. Your cash flow doesn't determine your sacred worth. And if you have more, then just share more. And don't block others from getting their needs met. You'd think it's so obvious it wouldn't need to be put in a sermon, but Jesus snuck it in just in case someone needed to hear it. Paul, in his correspondence, of course he doesn't know we're reading his mail, but in his letter that he wrote to a house church in Rome, he says that denying the dignity, the sacred value of others is a spiritual dis-ease called sin, and it gets in the way of a joyful life. We can't be our best selves. We We can't get all the joy of life there is to get if we are hurting others. But he says it with God talk the language of religion. And God talk is sometimes hard to understand. Because he's saying it in God talk, either we get so fixated on the words, almost making them idols and then into weapons, so now it becomes problematic, or because it sounded sort of spooky and weird and crazy and we didn't grow up with all that, we just tuned it out. And so that's, that's some of the issues of God talk. If you don't know the language, it doesn't make sense to you. And if you think you know the language, you may be getting it wrong anyway. Paul is saying that the condition that causes us to do mean and cruel things, that is sin. And it costs too much. It keeps us from enjoying life to the fullest. Sadly, people often quote Paul to manipulate and demean others, to do exactly what he says comes out of the condition of sin. They use Paul to demean others, using his words to demonstrate the sinful condition of cruelty that he decried. If Paul has been quoted, and I promise he has, to tell you that you are somehow not good enough, that you are somehow beyond the reach of God's love, that you are somehow damaged goods, that comes from a condition of sin, the very thing Paul talked about. Out of your brokenness, you're trying to hurt and break others. Stop that. The wages of that is too high. It cost people their lives and their happiness and their safety. Stop it, Paul says. Jesus says that greed is the opposite of godliness. Why are we hoarding? Why do I want more? Well, I don't care if you get even enough. Maybe I'm even trying to keep you from getting. What is that? That is greed. That is a brokenness. That is a sense of not enoughness. That is saying that I don't trust that I am one with the source of all good. And so I have to, to claw and scrape and push you out. And Jesus says that that is the opposite of godliness. God is love, and love shares abundantly, gladly, indiscriminately. You squeeze a tomato, you get tomato juice. If you're lucky, you get a Bloody Mary, but for sure you get, you get tomato juice. And if you squeeze an orange, you get orange juice. What you squeeze, it can only give you what it is. And if God is omnipresent love, if that's what we're calling God, then all we can get from God is all that God is, which is love. And so if we're hoarding, that is the opposite of love that gives itself away constantly. You can't be greedy and godly. To be godly, you've got to be kind. You've got to be loving. You've got to be generous. You've got to share your good. But Matthew's Jesus says it with God talk the language of religion. So either we think we know what he's saying before he says it so we don't listen, or it sounds like gobbledygook so we don't listen. Luckily, I have the gift of interpretation for religious gobbledygook. The older I get, the less God talk I use. 
I mean, the poetry of religion will always be with us. <laughs> For me, at least, it's an occupational hazard. But I don't need to blame God for my prejudices. I am not for this or against that because God told me anything. I don't need to use God as a crutch for my prejudices. And I don't need God to want me to be good in order for me to want to be good. I'm not good to please God. I'm not good to, so that God doesn't send me to hell without an electric fan. I'm not good so I get a better seat in heaven. I'm not good because God wants me to be good. I'm good because I'm, I want to be good. And then I want to be better. And I don't need God for that. I want to be kinder. I want to be more generous, whether God cares or not. And I don't need to use God as a bartering chip to get you to do or give or say or avoid anything in particular. When we ask you to support the ministries of this church, it's because the ministries of this church are good. You ought to get behind them. You ought to be excited about them. You want to make them happen. I'll never tell you to do it because God said to do it. I will never be so dishonest. I will never be so manipulative. I will never uh, be so, so blatantly manipulative. No, the ministries are good. You ought to be proud of them. You ought to make sure that you'll do all you can to make them happen, even if there were no God. In fact, we should double down if there's no God because we're on our own and they still have to happen. Oh, I don't need God as a bartering chip or as a weapon or as a ploy or as a, or as a carrot on a stick to get you to do or avoid anything. So if I resort to quoting a verse and then saying that that verse is God telling me to tell you that you ought to do this or avoid that? Please ignore me for the fool I've clearly become. The Bible says many things, and the reader makes as much meaning as the writers do, the writers who were also human, by the way. So the Bible says it's not the same as God says, and please remember that always. I'm tired of the abuse that is done. I'm tired of the cruelty that, that is done in the name of God says when all they do is quote something out of context that has been multiply translated from a language they never spoke, that comes from, trans, from manuscripts whose originals no longer exist. And so for you to take that and say, God says that I'm supposed to be mean to you, well, God told me just in my ear to tell you to shut up. The Bible says a lot of things. But that doesn't mean God said. And if it's mean, trust that it isn't God. For me, the mystery beyond naming, that's God. The mystery beyond naming, the experience beyond explanation, the peace that passes understanding. Oh, if you've got it all worked out, if you understand it all, that can't be God. God is the peace that passes understanding. God is joy unspeakable. If I can name it, it's not joyful enough. It's not God enough. For me, God is hope that is indomitable, the presence that is everywhere present. There's not a spot where God is not, so you can't be separated from it. For me, God is that light that surrounds and fills me. The question for which there is no answer, but there is empowerment in the asking. For me, God is the love that leaves no one out. And since Bible verses and creeds fall short of that something that I meekly and weakly call God, I find it better. For me, I'm not telling you what to do, but for me, I am finding it better to use less God language, less language that has been loaded and weaponized. And so I use less of that language to speak of the unspeakable, to refer to the unnameable, to point toward that that can't be fully known. But what I do know is that we are never more correct about God as when we are loving extravagantly, unconditionally, for no reason other than love is what we are and is what we are meant to share. What I want for me and for you, is a divine experience so rich that God talk seems too poor in comparison. And so we communicate on the level of love, of beauty, of hope, of peace, of shalom. I think we've used so much God talk that the words have become stumbling blocks. And so I use less of them now. You'll rarely ever hear me use words like salvation, righteousness, sin, redemption, heaven. And if I do, I have to explain it because I dare not trust that you think what I think those words mean. 
But for me, if it doesn't all boil down to love, and if love doesn't result in loving, then we've failed. If our faith has been used to weaponize, to make legislation that hurts people and shames people and erases people and silences people, well, we can't control all the legislatures, but we can take our faith back. We can say, that's not what we mean. That's not what our Jesus means. That's not what our understanding of God is. That's not what faith means for us. And when someone says, well, then you must not be a Christian. Well, if that's what a Christian is, you are correct. I must be something else. But unlike with most Christians, what people at the Sunshine Cathedral do is follow Jesus. And Jesus will always lead us in the ethics of love. And love can't be wrong. So I have no greater wisdom than this. I want to be smart. I want to be wise. I want to be brilliant. And at the end of the day, I'm just a hillbilly with some, with some degrees. So this is all I got. If God, if it's really God, it's love. And if it isn't love, it's not God enough. And if it's cruel, it's not love. If it's God, it's love. If it's not love, it's not God enough. And if it's cruel, it's not love. My dear friends, in the room, and in all the places you're joining us from, I love you. And any theology that doesn't lead me to that is garbage. The love we share is God in action. And this is the good news. Amen.